All right. Um, are we live? We are good to go? Not yet. Not yet. I think we are live now. All right. Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, today, Cam Pools is with us. He's going to walk us through some M magic in Power Query. Thanks a lot joining us, uh, for, for joining us, Ken. Oh, happy uh, to be here. Thanks our, for having me. It's our pleasure to have you as a guest speaker. Uh, I'll keep the introduction very brief because I, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, I'm ma many of you already know about Ken. He's a Microsoft MVP consultant at uh, Excel Group Canada. Uh, he's also co-author of the book M is for Data Man Monkey, which is one of the best books available today about Power Query. Uh, I think that that introduction is more than enough, but I'm wondering, <laughs> first question, is there any story behind that uh, name, Data Monkey? I love it. Uh, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of funny. We um, I don't even remember how we how we sort of came up with it. Well, I sort of do. I mean, data monkey is actually sort of a uh, was used as a derogatory term to talk about uh, you know to, to to say nice things about uh, about people that work in tech and and uh, are pushing data all the time. So um, we decided to just kind of embrace that and uh, and took it and said, look, you know what? We've got this M language. It's amazing. You know, data monkeys. Why not? We'll just embrace that and we'll own that term, kind of like we, we took over geek. It used to be something that people would say about you when they didn't like you. Now it's kind of a badge of honor. And um, so we came up with a title for Amage for Data Monkey. The challenge we ran into is when we started to write the book, we said, boy, we probably shouldn't be writing a book just on M. We need to write a book on Power Query. But the title was so cool that we decided to keep it anyway. So um, <laughs> that's kind of the backstory behind how, uh, how that one went. And um, as you can see, I mean, uh, I, I've got a, I got a monkey sitting in the chair behind me over here. I mean, the, the Data Monkey sort of becomes something that's uh, been synonymous with a lot of the stuff that we do. So um, just kind of a, I don't know, it's a, it was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, I love that name. I love that name personally. Um, the, the only challenge I will say with it is that when somebody goes in to look for a book of Power Query on the, on the bookshelf, uh, they don't usually think of looking for data monkeys first. I mean, maybe they do now, but uh, but certainly uh, I don't think it helped the uh, the sale of the book in any way. But um, but regardless, I mean, uh, we we love it. We uh, we own it. So there you go. That's the that's the story. Thanks for writing that wonderful book too. Uh, no worries, no worries. Um, I, I already see we have a comment in the chat from uh, from my friend Christian who says he's looking forward to the next edition of the book, which is uh, which is slated to come out this year, and uh, I actually. Uh, um, just submitted a whole bunch of uh, chapters to our publisher. Uh, it's not finished yet, but we're we're working on it. So we're we're making progress at long last, which is good. So, um, so yes, it is coming this year. It will be out. Um, all right, cool. Um, so I guess uh, at this point, uh, I'll just uh, just say uh, just a little brief intro into myself. I'm not going to throw up a slide for this today. I'm going to move into the content pretty quickly here. But as Halal uh, mentioned, my name is Ken Pulse. Um, I am an accountant. I'm based on the west coast of Canada. So for me right now, it's nine o'clock in the morning and I know we're covering uh, um, at least as far uh, east from here as, as getting to, uh, to Turkey, which I believe now is about uh, eight o'clock in the evening. So we got about uh, 11 time zones covered for sure, maybe more. Um, and I'm looking forward today to uh, showing you some just some some cool little M tricks. And honestly, when it comes down to Power Query, one of the things that I really, really love is using the user interface to do most of my work. I, I actually think that that's one of the super big strengths around Power Query is the fact that you can do so much by just clicking buttons to write code. But every now and then it helps to have a little bit of knowledge of the language so that we can make some tweaks to do things that we can't do through the user interface. And that's what this is about here is just making some simple tweaks along the way to our code in order to make things a little bit more robust and, and whatnot. Now, um, during this process, you're also going to see I have a piece of software that I've written, which is called Monkey Tools. I'm not going to focus on that a ton here, but there is going to be a place where I actually use that to do some timing of some stuff. And uh, outside that, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump into the presentation. Because we're covering so many time zones, I'm actually going to turn my camera off um, because I want to make sure that I preserve the maximum bandwidth so that we don't lose uh, my voice or the screen on this one here. So I'm going to turn that one off right now. So there we go. And let's go and take a look at what we've got for you today. So 
The first thing that I want to do is I want to jump into uh, pretty much the first set of tricks that most users will run into when they start working with the M language, and that's where we start to write custom column formula. So basically, um, here's the situation that I want to look at. I have a data table that looks like this, and I want to get to this. So base, or rather, the other way around, the desired output is on the left, the source data is on the right. So it comes in in this, this kind of ugly format that's tabular, but it's not really well laid out. I've got my employees that are nested in with my data, and I've got to extract them back out. Now, you can do this manually. It's entirely possible. It takes around 10 steps, and I'll actually walk through and show you what those 10 steps are in order to basically extract this information out. And I love this method because, hey, it works, right? And you can just click it with buttons, no coding knowledge necessary. It's a no-code solution. But if you can learn to write some formulas, you can actually make this a lot shorter. You can actually break it down to about five steps. And the key formulas that we're looking for are these ones, uh, a try time.from column one, otherwise null, and then an if time equals null, then out and work date, else null. These formulas are not complex, but they're also not super discoverable. And that's sort of the challenge here that we're looking at with this. So let me go in and show you exactly uh, what we get here. I'm going to jump over into uh, this workbook here, and I'm going to go and grab some data from a text or CSV file, which is where I've got this one stored. It's about 100,000 rows of data inside this solution. So here we go. I'm going to bring the data in. We're going to transform it, and we're going to load this guy up into Power Query. I think I'll just maximize the window. This is the other thing I love about Power Query is you get a full-size window so much better than that old post stamp size thing that you got from just plain old Excel. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to rename this one here. I'm just going to call this query data. And I'm going to do a quick little bit of prep. I don't need these top four rows. So we'll say remove top rows. We're going to get rid of the top four rows. And I'm going to promote the first row as headers. And now at this point in time, I'm also going to get rid of this thing here that says number of records. So I'm just going to filter this guy out. And there we go. Now the challenge that I've got here is that I've got John Thompson on row number one, and I've got Bob Johnson here on row 12, and Fred Markstrom on row 23. The problem is that I need to get John Thompson associated with rows 2 through 11, and Bob Johnson with rows 13 through 22. So I've got to extract these two columns out and get them down the side. I'm not worried about this number here. This is a, an employee number or something. I'm not 100% sure, but it's not relevant to the analysis that I'm going to do. So I'm going to go and expand this for a second, and I'm going to make two views off of this data. So I'm going to go right click, I'm going to reference this guy here, and this first one that I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this one, I'm going to call it UI. So this is going to be the user interface driven method for dealing with this. And here's how this is going to work. I'm going to go and duplicate the out column, and I'm going to duplicate the work date column. So we're going to get copies of both of these guys here. And now on the out column, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this one. I'm going to call this one time. I'm going to rename this one and call it date. And I'm going to change the time to be an actual time. Now, when I do this, this obviously triggers an error because it says, look, you know what? You can't convert John into a time. That just doesn't work. We're not going to let that happen. And again, um, you can't convert Bob into a time either. Okay, So Bob's got no time for this. So. The deal that we're going to do at this point is we're now going to go and say right click and we're going to replace the errors with a keyword of null. Four characters, all lowercase. There we go. Boom. We've now got nulls in place. So no more errors. And this is important. When you trigger errors, you generally want to treat them pretty quickly in Power Query so they don't break things later on. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to convert these dates here into dates. So we're going to go and change this to be a date. And at that point, we get some more errors because at this point here, we can't convert John Thompson into a date and we can't convert Bob Johnson into a date. They said no, so that's just not going to happen. So all good. Here's what we're going to do. Right click. We're going to go replace errors again with the keyword null. Bingo. There we go. So the errors are gone. The reason we've done this is because we now have some items that we can actually use to drive some conditional logic. If this is blank, I can do something. If it's not blank, I can do something else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these two columns here, right click, we're going to merge these two guys together. I'm going to use a custom separator here of comma space, and I'm just going to leave it called merged right now because I don't actually really care about this column too much, to be honest. And I say, OK, I've now got John Thompson, Bob Johnson, and Fred Markstrom all here. So I can now go and say add column, conditional column. And what we can do is we can make a new column here called worker. 
whoops, we'll try and spell that somewhat right. And what we're going to do is we're going to say if the time equals null, then we're going to pick a column. And that column that we're going to pick is the merged column. Else, in other words, if this is not a time, or sorry, if this is a time here, um, it has something, or a time or a date rather, I should be looking at the right column, there we go. Um, so this is 6 p.m., so it's going to come back with a null. And what we get is we get this. And this is fantastic because all we need to do to get John and Bob and Fred and Mary doing the right job here is we just need to call their coworker Phil. So here we go, Phil down, and boom, Phil's going to get them all into the right place. The final thing we do, we just go and we deselect our null and get rid of the merge column. So I'll just go and select that. There we go, delete it. And we could reorder the columns if we want, but that's not totally necessary. The key thing I want you to recognize about this whole thing is how many steps we actually had to get here. Okay, so we've done the job, it's worked. There's nothing wrong with that. The challenge is, and it's, it's all been driven through the UI, so there's no coding experience necessary, and it absolutely works. The question is, could we do this a little bit faster? And the answer is, if we use some formulas, that yes, we absolutely can. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna create a new version of this that shows how we can actually use some formulas to make this happen. So we'll go right click and reference, and this one here, I'm gonna go and call formulae. All right, now, um, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna create myself a custom column, right here, custom column. This one is gonna be called time. So I'm not really doing any of the other data prep that I had with duplicating columns and things like that from beforehand. I'm gonna run this little try, and this is kind of equivalent to Excel's if error statement. So we're gonna go with a try time.from, and we're gonna try and convert the out column into a time. If it works, it'll give us the time. Otherwise, it's gonna give us a null value. And this is really, really important when you start writing your own formulas here. The IntelliSense here will burn you. If you go and you hit tab on this, it's gonna convert it to null.type, which is not what you want. This thing, you need to hit escape in order to get the proper keyword. This is one of those things that just drives me absolutely crazy. Uh, I usually find that the IntelliSense is really helpful for knowing what you can do. And every time you press tab, it unfortunately gives you the wrong thing. It's, it's one of those things you gotta watch really carefully. Um, but regardless, when I go and say, okay, now you'll notice that I've actually shortcutted right away <coughs> into a situation here where I've got that null and I've got all of my dates just by writing a simple little formula here. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go and create myself a worker column. I'm going to go custom column on this one here. We're going to go and say worker and the formula for this one, I'm just going to write a manual little if function. So this is going to be if my time equals the null keyword, I'll hit escape again. This is kind of cool. I can hit enter on this too and do this on, uh, on individual lines here. So if the time equals null, then we're going to go with out. Um, and we're going to go with quote, space, quote, and, and we'll pick up the work date column. So this one here, I've actually decided to go the other way. I'm going John space Thompson, although I could flip it and, and work with the commas that I did before if I wanted to. And uh, at this point, for whatever reason, sometimes when you're working with this, these custom columns here, Power Query is refusing to let me hit the enter key to move to the next line. So if I wanna actually fix that, I'll need to actually commit this first and then come back to it. But I'm just gonna put in an else null. And let's just go see if it'll let me uh, hard return it now. Just some weird stuff that happens in these dialogues, unfortunately. All right, so if the time equals null, then I want out and work date, else I'd like null. So. I'm going to go and say OK to this, and what I get is I get this nice little column that looks like this, so that's pretty cool here. So I can now go and say right click, fill down. Uh, at this point, I can now go and say let's get rid of all of the records here that have nulls in them. So we'll get rid of those guys there, convert the work date to a date, and finally get rid of the out column. And at that point, I've got the same thing. What you'll notice at this particular point here is that we've only got about five or six steps, whereas in the UI query, we have a lot more. So same job, different approach. And um, at the end of the day, it just took knowing a little bit of stuff around M. The big challenge that I run into when I'm working with these guys here is that 
trying to find documentation on this function is actually kind of difficult. And uh, the, the problem is, you know, of course, when you do a Google search for try, it comes back with all kinds of stuff. And when you do a Google search for try M, you're going to get something for probably either candy, uh, like M&Ms, or you're going to get something for, um, you know, for a Power Query language thing, but it's not going to take you to someplace. This just doesn't seem to be documented very well, which is a shame. So this is basically the equivalent of if error inside uh, Excel. If you're not familiar with it, you may want to keep that in mind. It is a try otherwise is the, uh, the setup for it. Um, now, that's the first example that, uh, that we've got here. So I'm just going to go and say uh, home, close, and load. These will load to connection-only queries for me um, because that's the way that I've got my default set on that. And uh, if I wanted to, of course, I could load the data now and, uh, and use it any, any way I like. So, uh, so that's the first example I've got for you of just how we can actually make some simple little M tricks that, uh, that can work with, uh, with some different things. And for the next one, I'm going to open up something else, but I'm going to flip back to my presentation and show you where we're going next. So where is my presentation? There it is. Excellent. The next thing that I want to show you here is how we can actually use a little bit of custom code inside Power Query to gracefully handle load errors. There are a couple of different types of load errors that we can run into. The first one is what we call a step level error. Now, these errors here can occur for a variety of reasons, and the problem that we have with them is that they prevent your queries from loading. Basically, this is an error at a step level, which is why we actually call them this. If there is an error at that point, when you go into Power Query, you select that step, you'll see the big yellow message that comes across. It's prevented loading because something's broken. And there's a lot of different reasons this can actually happen, um, but it's irritating. And uh, anybody that's worked with Power Query for any period of time will have run, run into one of these things, um, scratch their head on it, torn some hair out and, and whatnot in order to get past it at some point. So what I want to show you here is how we can actually gracefully handle these and get into a place um, that, uh, that will make life a little easier. Um, sorry, I just want to deal with one question in the queue here. Is the null text data or a special null data type, uh, guessing a data type? Yeah, it is a, um, a null is a specific keyword. It's not actually text. If you wanted the null to be text, you would actually have to wrap it in quotes. So that's a different thing. Um, if you just put in null without any quotes, um, at that point in time, what you get is they get that special keyword. And basically what null is, is it's, well, this is hard, right? It's null. It's essentially the same as blank or empty, although truly in programming languages, those are all distinct things, but they're pretty much treated the same way. When you've got that keyword, it's italicized and it says null. When you load it to a worksheet or to your data model inside Excel or Power BI, at that point, it just comes up as blank. There's nothing there. So hopefully that makes sense. If you put it in quotes um, at that point in time, then you would actually get the text value N-U-L-L -L, showing up inside your column. Okay, so uh, that's the, the big difference there. Um, Faraz is asking, will there be any performance boost in the formula versus the UI method? I don't believe that there's going to be anything of significance. Um, I haven't actually tested that, although we could, but, um, but uh, now you've given me homework, Faraz, so I'll have to, uh, to go back and actually take a look at that. Uh, all right, let's go back to our uh, gracefully handling our, uh, our load errors here. Um, what I want to do is this. Um, I want to actually set up a scenario where I'm going to break something with a step level error and prevent my data from loading. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a, um, an alternate uh, a message or a table definition so that I can then load stuff even if there are errors in my data. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this. I'm going to add myself a final step that says try, and then we'll put in the previous step. Otherwise, we'll go with an alternate step name or query in order to make this happen. So here's how this one's going to work. You can see here <laughs> that I have a few different queries, okay? So what I'm, I'm going to look at these in, in an individual basis in a bit, but the thing that I want you to recognize is that this blue table over here with all two of its records, if I come right-click on this guy right here, it's going to refresh, and you'll be able to watch the query loads over here, and then it lands the data right here. So all's good. The problem is when somebody comes along and changes the name of the column to amounts because they want it to be plural. All right, no problem, right? Right click, refresh, and at this point in time, we get a nice little error that says the column amount of the table wasn't found. This confuses the heck out of people when they're running into it. Why? What happened? What's going on? I see this all the time with unpivot solutions where people have gone and actually hard-coded dates for a specific year, and then they roll forward to the next year, and none of the 2018 dates are in the data in 2019 anymore, so it throws these big errors. 
So uh, basically, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go take a quick look at the transactions query for a second and see what caused this error in the first place. If you're debugging these things, we'll go back to the source step. And here we go. Everything looks fine right here. We can see that it's got amounts right here. But when we get to the change type step, you'll notice that it comes back and says the column amount wasn't found. And that's because, of course, this is hard-coded to amount, and the amounts column is gone. Now, as it happens, I have another query over here that I've set up. It's called error one. It's a really technical query, super huge. All I did was create a blank query, and in the formula bar, I typed there was an error, exclamation mark. It's just text, okay? That's all it is. So what I want to do is I want to feed this back if there's an error over here that prevents us from loading. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the advanced editor inside Power Query, and we're gonna open up the ever intimidating and horrible Power Query code. So if you've never been in this environment, this is a little bit crazy because you know we got lots of curly brackets, we got hashtags and quotes all over the place, but the big sort of secret behind understanding what's going on inside here is that every time you write or you, you click a user interface button, it generates a formula in the formula bar. You can see table transform column type source is right here. This is the formula that you can see. So this is the change type step, which appears to the left-hand side of the equals character. You'll also notice when you look at this, the keyword here source shows up right here. That's the name of the previous step. So if you're driving through the user interface, Every step name you see here will start off here with an equals. This will be the formula from that step. There will be a comma after it, and then it's gonna go into the next step name, change type, the next formula, which will refer back most likely to the previous step. This is the only line that doesn't get a comma. It's the one before the line that says in, and then after the in, we put in the final step name. So using this pattern, I'm gonna do this. I know that the final step before the in should not have a comma after it, so I'm gonna add a comma here, and I'm gonna go and put in a new line here that says output equals, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually write this little formula. Try, we're gonna go with the previous step name, which is hashtag change type. Gotta spell it and case it correctly, that's really important. Otherwise, Love it when the IntelliSense actually works for me there. Uh, otherwise, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a different query name. So I'm gonna go with error, and I'm gonna go error one here. There we go. Now, the problem that I have at this point is if I commit this query, it's still gonna return the change type step. So I need it to say, don't return that one. I would like you to return the output step instead. Okay, so there we go. Now at this point, what we should get is that there was an error. So if I go back and say close and load, it should load, and it says there was an error. If I come back and change this back to amount, which is what it was originally, right click and reference, the table comes back. If we go back and put it into amount to something different, basically, anything that isn't amount, and we hit refresh, boom, there we go, we get back to there was an error. Okay, so that works fairly well, but, what if you had a whole bunch of VLOOKUPs built against this table and you actually needed the vendor column? Well, now you've got a problem on your hands because your formulas could break. And if you start inserting new columns in the table after that, they might not come back properly. So what I really want to do is I really want to actually hand back, if there's an error, a table definition that doesn't change. In other words, I want something that says date, vendor, amount, no matter what happens over here. So to deal with this, I'm gonna go back to my transactions query. We're gonna go and expand this a little bit because I'm gonna change this final step here with this, this try otherwise error one. I have this other query over here called error two that I've built. Now again, this is not a super, super technical query. Basically what I did have to do though is I had to go and learn how to write this. Now this is a function that I did a, a little Google search on uh, on the Power Query formula language, and I ended up at the uh, Microsoft Developer Network, MSDN, uh, actually I think it's on Docs now, um, for the Power Query M code specifications. And I went through and looked through the, uh, the whole sort of setup to try and figure out, oh, I can build a table from records. You can also do this, by the way, if you're inside Power Query and you're running on Office 365, you can actually create yourself a table right here by going enter data. And this is probably an easier way to do things where you get to use the user interface. There's nothing saying you have to code this particular piece here. 
What I've done is I've created myself a column that has a January 1st, 1900 date in it. Uh, the vendor comes back with an error. There is an amount column that has zero in it. And I've called this query error too. So I'm gonna go back to transactions here. And what I'm gonna do is I can either do this through the advanced editor by changing this error one to error two, or I could come up here right in the formula bar where I can see error one and change that to error two. At that point, if I hit tab on this one, no, nope, it's gonna make me click somewhere else. There we go, now I get back this table definition. So if I come back, boom, there we go. So now if I get amount and we hit refresh, I've got my table. If this gets changed to anything else, whoop, not in the data, in the header itself, boom, there we go. Refresh, it comes back and tells me that there's an error. This is gonna be better if you've got stuff. Um, one of the number one concerns that I would have about using the previous method um, where we actually returned a single piece of text is if this table loads to the data model and there is a relationship based on the vendor column and I've got something that actually loses the vendor column, the relationship in the data model will get deleted and it will not come back when you fix the table definition. So using something like this is a good future-proofing technique to say, hey, if there's ever anything wrong, feed out a blank table definition just so that I don't compromise the model and kick me back a message so that I know so that I can actually go and figure out what's going on. So it's just a helpful little uh, sort of um, you know, future-proofing tip that can allow you to, uh, to save yourself some, uh, some headaches uh, a little longer uh, down the road. So again, uh, if I go and, uh, and show you this, I'm actually gonna pop this open in, in my tool just so you can, uh, can see what the, uh, what the formula actually looks like here. Uh, this is all, uh, all indented and whatnot, but basically the big secret here is our original step was our source, and this is the, the Excel workbook that we have, just looking at it in an indented format. Uh, here is the change type step that we had. This is the originally coded one. It originally went all the way up to here, not including the comma. So all we did after that final line was add a comma, give a unique step name equals, we try the previous type or previous step, make sure that you code it exactly the same. Otherwise we use the error definition for another table that we've actually created. And then we just we need to make sure that this matches what we have here. Okay, so that's the, the overall thing. So hopefully, um, I know this is being recorded on video, people will be able to, to take a look back at that and actually see what's, uh, what's happening in that uh, particular regard. It's a handy little, uh, handy little trick that, uh, as I say, can future-proof some danger in your models if, uh, if things are changing on you. All right, so let me, uh, let me close that one. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump over and take a look at another scenario um, that I want to uh, play around with as well. And this one is uh, calendar dimensions. So the, um, there's a couple of different things that I wanna sort of look at, uh, well, a couple of different things I'm going to show you in this, this particular piece here. So when I'm working on dimensional models, I build all of my calendars on the fly with Power Query. And the, the trick on this one here is that we're going to use the user interface to generate a start date and an end date, the boundaries for the calendar, and then we're going to use a little custom M code to actually build the calendar itself. And the custom M code is not too difficult once you actually know what the pattern is. This is the recipe for generating the start date for your query. So basically what this is doing is it's gonna be looking at whatever table will have the earliest potential date ever. Typically I go after say my sales table or something like this, cause we're always selling. Uh, we get rid of all the dates uh, or everything except for the dates column, filter to the earliest date, remove our duplicates. We transform it back to the start of the year. If you are using a non-standard fiscal year end at this point in time, right around between steps five and six, you would actually go and make an adjustment to what that's the, the start of year is. So you'd, you'd have to use a little custom M here to shift the dates back and forwards. Um, and then we drill down into it to get just that specific date. The recipe for the end date looks like this. Basically everywhere you saw earliest, you switch it to latest and everywhere you see start, you switch it to end. That's basically the, the, uh, the difference between uh, these two guys here. So, um, so that's the first part. That's how we create our start and end. And then what we do is we go and we create a calendar. And the calendar is gonna look like this. We create a blank query and we use this specific formula. And if you've called your start date, start date with no spaces, just like I did, and your end date, end date with no spaces, just like I did, and you case it the same, this formula will never ever change. It's always equals open curly brace, number dot from start date, dot dot, number dot from end date, close the curly brace. This creates a list of all the dates, which you then convert to a table, you switch the data type, you rename it to date, change the name of the, the query to calendar, 
and load it to the data model. And optionally, if you want other date periods in there, like year and month and things like that, you would add those as well. So let's go take a look at this one here. Uh, what I'm going to do is let me just open up the, uh, the file that I'm actually uh, playing around with and looking at here. So this has got a, a little pivot table that's uh, been built in here. Um, and you can see that I have some, uh, some actual sales and some budgets here. I should probably just take a quick look at my data model and see what I've actually got inside this workbook. And right now you can see I've got my accounts. Here's my budgets. This is probably a good candidate for the, uh, for the um, end date, picking up the end of the year for this guy here. And for my sales, you can see that we've started here on January 1st, uh, or sorry, January 31st, 2019. I would actually start my calendar on the first of the month for 2019 because that's when the year starts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and build a calendar for this. Now, one of the things I didn't mention to you is that all of my data for every data model that I ever built is always, always, always sourced via Power Query. I never, ever go and use something like add to model right from here because it doesn't go through Power Query. That's a bad thing. Um, I also don't go into Power Pivot and use the connectors inside Power Pivot without going through Power Query. In the data model inside Power BI, you really don't have a choice. You have to go through Power Query in order to get your stuff set up. That's the way that it should be in Excel today and as well, in my opinion. So this is kind of an important thing. We want to have that query because I'm going to leverage these in order to go and make my start date and end date. So I'm going to start here with sales. I'm going to go right click and I'm going to reference it. So this is going to create a pointer to the sales table. If I come back in here, you can see that if I open this up, here is sales, here is sales two, sales two, reads from sales. So whatever happens in sales is going to flow through to this one. I'm just going to rename this one here to start date. And now I'm going to run that recipe pattern in order to make this work. So we're going to right click, remove other columns. We're going to right click. We're going to remove duplicates. We're going to go and filter this one here to a date filter is earliest. We're going to go to transform, date, year, start of year. Now again, at this point, if I was using a non-standard fiscal year, I would actually add a custom column to shift this date the way that I need to, and then use that for going forward. I'm not going to worry about that nuance here. So what I am going to do though, is I'm going to change this to a date, even though it already is one. This is just something to make sure that this always works going forward. And then I'm going to drill down. The big secret with this is you do not want to drill down by clicking the header. You've got to scroll a long way down to do that. We want to go right click here where there's very, very few options and drill down. What's going to happen here? You will now get just your individual date. I'm just going to move him down here into this folder that I've made called staging queries. Okay, so that's the earliest date that will ever appear in this data model because this is dynamically going to be refreshing based on the data in the sales table. I'm now going to get my latest date and I'm going to pull this one from the budgets table. Now this, this always comes up uh, when we're dealing with this one is, how do you know which table to pull your end date from? And the answer really comes down to, it needs to be the table that will always have the latest date in, as based on your data model. That means that if your company is in the habit of budgeting after the fiscal year starts, you probably don't wanna use the budget table because the data may not be there when you roll over from your new year. And yes, I actually worked for a company that was exactly one of those. In that case, I would base things on the sales table and advance it by a couple of years. This is probably the way I would go at it. Um, if your budgets are always done before the year end though, your budgets table is probably a good choice. So you have to think about that kind of stuff. All right, let me move this guy down here. We're gonna run the same pattern. Right click, remove other columns. Right click, we're gonna go and uh, remove our duplicates. This time we're gonna filter, date filter to the is latest date to get to March 31st. We're now gonna go transform date, year, we're gonna choose the end of the year. Okay, so there we go. Again, if I was working with a non-standard fiscal year end, I would add a custom column to shift this date by X number of months to get it into the right spot. But in this case, I'm not gonna do that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and say, let's set the data type to a date, right click, drill down. There we go, there's my end date, dynamically built off of the tables, even though the budget's only been posted to March 31st. The next step is to create my custom calendar. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go new query from file. Oh, no, I'm not. We're gonna go from other sources, blank query. I'm gonna rename this one to calendar. I actually kind of like to do this right away just so that I know what the heck I'm working on because sometimes I forget. All right, 
And now here comes the magic formula equals three brace. And it is number dot from open parenthesis. You can alternately put space in this, but you don't have to. But I'm going to go with start date. And then basically what we do is in, in Excel, you would use the colon to separate uh, two things and make a range out of them. In Power Query, we use a colon, but it's lying down. So it's two periods. Basically, it just fell over. And uh, now we're going to go once again with number dot from. I'm going to open my parenthesis and we're going to put in end date and then I'm just going to space this out. Again, the spacing is totally optional. I just find it makes it a little bit more readable here and Power Query will, uh, will ignore those spaces as it goes to actually parse the stuff out. When we do this, this is the nice, handy and consistent formula here. The big thing you want to watch for, your start date must match exactly what you have here. We do not use spaces inside start and date because if we did, this would have to be hashtag quote start space date quote and that's just ugly. So we're going to smash it all together as one word to make our life easier. Nobody's ever going to read this part of our code anyway, except you. So, you know, make it easy on yourself. This yeah, gives there, us... There, there's, there, sorry, sorry, Ken. Yeah, there's one, one question. One, sure. We are wondering why, do, why don't we use sales table for both start date and end date? And date? Yeah. Yeah, you could. Um, you absolutely could. Uh, the deal for me, though, is that typically um, the way that I would go with this stuff is that I prefer to have my end date based on my budget because I usually budget before sales happen. So what uh, what's supposed to happen is at that point in time, I can now use my data to create forecasts into next year where the sales may not exist. So it's really about trying to make sure that the, the um, calendar table will never have stuff that ends up being needed that doesn't have a date to cover it. Okay, so, but at the end of the day, if you believe that everything can be based off your start date and you're never going to run into that issue, then use start date. No problem. Like, sorry, use the sales table. No problem. It, it's totally up to you. You have to think about your model and, and as to which um, component will be the, the right one in order to, to work with there. So I hope that makes sense. It, it's, it's kind of a personal preference choice. Uh, one of the big things I will say with these things is oftentimes we go into building a model here. We choose a method and we go with it and we use it as our standard until it burns us and we learn to do something different, right? So in my world, I base things off budget. Unless I know that my company will come back and not budget in advance, if there's a reasonable chance of that, then I'm gonna use a different logic. That's basically the house I sort of go with these ones here. So again, totally your call. Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay. We've got our calendar table, except that right now it's actually not a table, it's a list. We can see that it says list tools up the top. You'll notice all the transforms, the add columns, all these great commands in Power Query, they're like all grayed out, we can't use them. So we gotta go and convert this list into a table. So I'm gonna do that, convert this to table, and then as quickly as you can, you click okay, because you never change the defaults here. They're just there to slow you down. And now we've got a table. Now it looks the same, except that maybe the numbers are aligned to the right, but Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna change this to be date. We're gonna change this to be an actual date. And at this point in time, I've now got a calendar that spans from the first day to the last day with a granularity of one day with no gaps whatsoever, which is exactly what you want for your, um, for your table inside your Excel or Power BI data model. Okay, so that's the quick way of doing it. And then basically what you can do after this, is you can say, hey, you know what? I really need to have a year column. I really need to have a month. I really need to have a name of month. There we go. And then I, this drives me crazy. I wish that we had an option to get a short name of month right here, but we don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to transform extract. And uh, I like to use the first three characters for my month name so they don't show up super long on my legends. Um, but there we go. So I've now built a calendar nice and quick that is completely dynamic to my data. Could I use DAX? Yes. Would I? No. I prefer to have all of my stuff done inside Power Query because I have the ultimate granular control over the start date, the end date. I'm not relying on Power BI or, or Excel to figure that out. Um, I also have the ability to add exactly what columns I want and all this kind of stuff. It just gives me better control and it handles all of this at load time rather than having any impact at runtime. So uh, for me, I always use Power Query for my calendars. At this point, I'm now gonna go and click OK. This is gonna load these three queries. Uh, because we only get to choose one load destination inside Excel, I now need to go and change this guy here to go to the data model. I didn't wanna load start date and end date to the data model um, as well. So, so there we go. I now have a calendar table 
that I can actually um, use inside my data model if I wanted to link all that stuff together and, and whatnot. Okay, so again, just you know, some short little M tricks in this thing around writing the formulas inside the uh, the formula bar in order to make this work to build useful patterns for what we're actually doing. That's the, the sort of the whole point behind these guys. And as I say, that formula right there, providing that you call it start date with a capital S and a capital D and no spaces in between, this formula never changes. Um, this is just a recipe that I can use over and over and over again and have in, in a lot of the uh, projects that I've actually done. All right, let's talk about another one. Now, this one here can actually be super problematic for people. Um, the issue that we have is that we've got a nice table for our customers and our customer number is the primary key. So this is all good and everything else. We've linked the primary key to our fact table for our sales and no big deal until a customer moves. So at this point in time, we've got Bob comes along and says, look, I'm, I've moved to a new address. And we don't want to just ignore the change because we want Bob to get his mail. We don't want to overwrite the record because we want to know what our historical sales are for the individual towns that we're in. So Bob was you know, originally in Surrey here. Uh, unfortunately, he's moved to Vancouver. So we end up adding a new row to actually record that inside our customer's table. The problem is, is that we now have two customer IDs, number two, inside our dimension. Because in Power Pivot for Excel, certainly what we end up with in this case here is we now have a problem because in Power Pivot for Excel, we only have the ability to create a one-to-many join. And this is going to cause us a big issue because, um, because this is going to actually break the relationship. Now in Power BI, you can, you can, you shouldn't, but you can go and set a many-to-many -many join across the table. Uh, honestly, I would never do that. I would actually fix this problem, which is what I'm sort of looking at here. The solution to solving this is to create what we call a type two slowly changing dimension. And the type two slowly changing dimension essentially adds some effective date columns. So we have a from date and a to date. And then what we do is we actually add uh, what we call a surrogate key to act as the primary key for the table. So what I've got showing here is what we actually call a surrogate key with meaning. You'll notice that the first portion, the, the, uh, the left side of the dot, is the original customer primary key. And on the second side of the dot, we actually have um, the instance number. So on row two, we've got Bob 2.1, and on row, two, on row four, we've got Bob 2.2. This scenario would allow for up to, well, if I start with, uh, I guess depending on what I do with my zero here, uh, this would allow for up to 10 address changes. If I needed to go more than that, say Bob is, uh, was kind of a guy that moves around a lot, I could make that two digits after the, uh, the dot and then I could allow for up to 100 changes. Three digits would allow for up to 1,000 changes, four up to 10,000 changes. Um, I'm not gonna walk you through this entire solution for how to do this because this is actually quite long. It takes about 40 minutes to sort of explain everything from, from end to end, but I am gonna show you a couple of key components around this particular pattern. The first one is that that effective dates column with the from and the to, unfortunately, all of those to dates, those need to actually be filled in. But with what? We don't know what date it's going to go to because it's going to go until whenever somebody moves. So that could be never, or it could be tomorrow, or in the case of Bob, it could be February 15th, 2019, where we've actually locked that in. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to replace those blanks with a specific value. So there's a recipe for dealing with this too, which is, which is handy. So here we go. If we can assume, for example, that I shot this on July 18th, 2019, what I would do is I would take this and say, let's fill it in with today's date. Let's, let's make sure that we know that every time we pull in this table, I know I, I just you know, fill it with the current date for these particular things. So basically what we do is this. We create a query to hold the end date. Now, I'm using the calendar pattern for that. I've already got an end date that's going to be the end of my model. That's a great, uh, great component. Or I could use a today value if I wanted to. I'm going to just go with the end date because we've already built it. We're going to modify our dimension holding the two column. And basically what we need to do is we need to do a manual replacement of values and then tweak the M code. Okay, so let me just go and show you how this would actually work. So if I go and take a look at my customers table, uh, you'll notice here that I have my customers all set up, but I'm gonna go in and grab a new record here for Bob. So we're gonna go in and say, okay, cool, that looks good. Uh, actually, you know what, I missed a piece, I think. 
because I think I've got something hidden over here. Yep, there we are. I need to make sure that Bob's record also goes to February 16th. The trick with this, this guy here needs to be one day after wherever he moved from. We don't want an overlap between these two things. Now that I have this in place, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into my customers table. And I'm just gonna go and remove this last step that removed those columns so that everything would load. And you'll notice that I now have all four records. Here's two records for my customer IDs, one, two, three, two. And over here, I've got my individual date, but I need to fill these with whatever the latest date is for this particular data model. The challenge that I've got is that I want to put in the end date over here, December 31st, 2019, because that's the last date in the model. And as you're gonna see very quickly here, I actually can't do that through the user interface. So I'm gonna go and say replace values. And we're gonna replace null. And what I really want to do here is I want to choose the query end date. But you'll notice that we don't have that ability. We've got date, I've got parameter grayed out. The reason parameter is grayed out is because I don't actually have any true parameters here. And the problem with parameters is the parameters are static. They're not dynamic. I need this to be query. So I can't do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, you know what, let's just do this then. 2019, uh, let's go 07-18. I'm just gonna throw something in here right now. So I'm putting in a, a valid date. And what you'll notice is that it actually does go and throw that in. So here's the thing though. In the formula bar, you'll notice that it actually puts in this hash date, open paren, 2019, comma seven, comma 18. Well, I'm just gonna go and change this out. End date, simple little tweak. And at that point, we now have December 31st, 2019. So there we go, nice and simple. And at this point, this will now again, dynamically regenerate. So that if there's any blanks in here, it's automatically filled in with the same end date that I'm using to drive my calendar table. So I know there's never gonna be any mismatches in that particular area. So hopefully that uh, can, makes can, sense. Can, 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 can yeah. I ask you a question? Uh, sure. I love that uh, trick, but don't you think that this is a design flaw? I mean, do I think the, it's it, mm, a design flaw in where? In, 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 in uh, Power Query Editor maybe? Or uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. So, so should Power Query allow you to actually be able to choose from a query in yes, that, in that exactly. box right off the bat? Of course yes, it should, exactly. absolutely. But you know, here's here's my thing, Hello, I, I'm not to wonder why. I gotta work around the problems for the stuff that they don't put in, right? So, um, but yeah, 100%, I absolutely agree that yes, that is that is something that should exist in there and it drives me crazy that it doesn't. I mean, you know, there, there's so much more though, right? Like, why can I not have the ability to manage parameters right from the Excel user interface? How come I have to come into Power Query to do that? Like, there, there's all kinds of things that, that I think need to be improved and fixed. But I'm also like, I mean, I'll go on record saying this is that I have great faith that the Power Query team actually wants to do all these things, but they also have a limited time and resources for these things. So, you know, is it a design flaw? Maybe, is it an oversight? Maybe, is it on the bucket list? Don't know, um, but you know, maybe one day, and, and certainly if we put enough votes in user voice, they'll, they'll end up adding those kind of things, right? So, but yeah, I, certainly I would love to have it there. It definitely would make my life easier. Um, okay. Let's take a look at the next, uh, next component for this one here. Um, creating a meaningful surrogate key. So <clears throat> there's two different ways to make a surrogate key for your table. And if you're actually in a true BI modeler sense of the word, they will tell you that a surrogate key should never have meaning because it's an artificial thing. The whole word surrogate is something we made up, you know, or is, it indicates that it's been made up. It's, it's not factual data or not natural data. Now, the deal with this one here though, is that for, a self-service BI modeler, we like to have meaning around the data that we're working with. And if we've created these keys, we wanna be able to trace them a little bit easier. So for this particular case, sometimes it makes sense for a self-service person to actually go and make themselves a meaningful circuit key. Now there's a recipe for dealing with this and it looks like this. Um, I'm not gonna actually go through all the steps of this, but I am gonna show you how this works. So basically this is on video now. So if you're watching this later and you hit pause, you'll be able to read this whole thing and, and recognize after you see the steps here, what these things are, are actually about. So I'm just gonna hop back over in here uh, into Power Query. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at how to deal with this. So what I'm looking for at this particular case is I want to go and make a record that is 1.1, 2.1, 3.1 and 2.2, .2, okay? So this is the second instance of Bob here. 
So this is kind of a neat one because there's some fun stuff that happens around this. It takes a little bit of M code, also takes a, a little bit of advanced uh, grouping stuff. So we're going to go to transform. We're going to take our dimension table here and I'm going to go to group by. And this is dangerous because this loads to the data model. So if I don't complete this, it's going to blow up my data model. So we got to make sure we take it all the way through the end. So we're going to go uh, group by. And um, basically what I want to do here is I want to make sure that I'm grouping by my primary key, which is customer ID. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change the grouping here to all rows. And I actually just want to go to advance here, sorry. Um, so grouping by the primary key, we're going to change the aggregation. We're going to create ourselves a nice little column here called data. Okay, so it's nice and simple. Just data, all rows, grouping on the primary key. When I do this, I get back this. Customer one, two, three, table, table, table. Now the cool thing about this, if you've never seen this before, is we click in the white space beside one of these green keywords. We don't want to click on the keyword, it drills in. So we want us to be able to see things. This now gives me a preview of what data is in here. So this is Fred's records. This is Bob's records. You can see there are two of them. And this is John's record. Now, the problem is that I need to be able to add a row number to the nested table here. This involves writing a little M code in a custom column. So we're gonna go custom column, I'm going to leave it called custom. I really don't care what it's called. And the column that I'm actually looking for, or the command I'm looking for is table.addIndex column. Now, this is another area here. Uh, you would have seen I wrote table.addIndex. As soon as I saw it, I hit tab. And then it always does this to you. I got table, table, add index column. That's not valid. So we got to get rid of this. It did preface it with table again. Really frustrating. But anyway, right? if I get rid of that, it comes back and says, okay, cool. So there are four arguments to this. The first one is the table. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to take the table that we have in the data column for each cell. And then it says, all right, what would you like the new column name to be? I'm going to call this ID. And it says, what would you like your initial value to be? Where do you want to start counting from? So I could make this zero, but I'm going to start with one. And then it says, how much would you like to increment it? So every time I change the value, what do you want me to change it by? I'm going to say one and close the parentheses. This is a very, very easy little formula. Part of a recipe, as I say, that we can, we can use. When I say OK, I get a new column of tables. The difference is this one has an ID column. This one does not. Okay, So we can see that that happens. And when we get down here, we've now got a one point, or a, a, we've got two with record ID 1 and record ID 2. So here's the cool thing with this. Right click, remove all the columns that we use for grouping. And then we can expand, get rid of the original column name as prefix. And there we go. We've now got all of the columns out of here. So this is pretty cool. There's two things left to do on this one. Three, actually. I'm going to grab these two columns. I'm going to go to Add Column, Merge Columns. I'm going to merge this with a custom separator of a period. And I'm going to call this one here LNK customer ID. So that's my linking field for the customer ID. I now get a 1.1, 2.1. That's cool. I'm going to get rid of the ID column because I don't need that anymore. And now basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all of these guys here, go to transform, detect data type, and then I'm just going to review things here and make sure that I'm using the best and most efficient data types that I possibly can. One thing you should be aware of, decimal is not as efficient as something like currency or in Power BI, it's called fixed decimal number. This will actually limit it to four decimal places where decimal will carry up to 15. So I'm just gonna replace that one there. At this point, I now have something that's showing me with extra zeros, but that's okay. Those get suppressed in the, in the true data model. But what you can see is I've got record 1.10, 2.10, 2.20. So we've now got two instances of Fred or two instances for Bob that are unique. The next step that I'm actually not going to show you here is we need to merge this back against the original sales table to replace the customer ID key for every given date. This is a little bit longer pattern. I don't have time to go through that today. Um, but the key thing is we can actually replace this or replace the customer ID in the sales table with this customer ID and then replace the relationship. And at that point, our type 2 slowly change in dimension will allow us to refresh every time a customer moves regardless, as long as we've anticipated that we've given them sufficient uh, components to do that.
So um, again, some, some helpful little M tricks around this thing to play around with. That table.addindex column uh, is kind of a, an interesting little pattern. We have a, a pattern in one of my Power Query recipe cards called numbering grouped rows. Um, this is where it gets applied in the real world with the type 2 slowly changing dimensions. So just kind of some, uh, some neat components around uh, what we can do with some simple tricks there. It's, a, it's one of these things that uh, I fully believe with, uh, with Power Query that um, a really, really successful program is one where you never have to learn to code. And this is actually failing because there's still a duplicate value that is sitting on that key because I actually haven't gone and replaced the relationship. So as I say, I don't have time to take us all the way through fixing that, but that's what's going on is that there is a relationship between the customer's table and the sales table based on that original primary ID or primary key that still has duplicate value. So that's what we're trying to fix long term. Um, so again, as far as Power Query goes, I, I love Power Query for its ability to do things through the user inter interface. And I think this is one of the reasons it's become so successful is because you don't have to learn a lot of code. But when you do learn a little bit, it opens up your world even more, right? You don't want to get to the point where you're writing everything from scratch. I think that's unnecessary. But if you can get to the point where you can tweak it a little bit here or there, that changes things in a big way. Uh, all right, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to move on to uh, our next one here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, this one's a favorite of a lot of people here. It's what we call buffer functions. And the big deal here is that um, there are certain things that can force Power Query to actually reload data multiple times when you're working with it. There is a technique that we can use, a, a command that we can use, which is called a buffer. And what the buffer does is it allows us to cache our data into a cache so that it doesn't get refreshed multiple times. And the way that this has sort of been explained to me uh, by one of the Excel program managers is, if you think about it, you've got a list of grocery items that you need to get. You need to get milk, you need to get eggs, you need to get bread. Does it make sense to go to the store, walk in the store, grab your eggs, go to the till, pay for the eggs, take them to your car, go back into the store, get your, um, your milk, go pay for your milk, take it to the car, go back in the store, get your bread, take it to the till, pay for it, and go back to the car? That doesn't make sense. This is what the buffer function is essentially trying to solve. The thing that you got to be careful with with the buffer function, though, is that the buffer function is kind of equivalent of saying, I'm at home and need to go to the grocery store, so I'll just go and bring the entire grocery store and put it in my own fridge. And that way, whenever I need it, I just go to my fridge and get what I need. So I'm going to make one big trip with a huge truck. I'm going to grab everything, pay for it all at once, load it all into my fridge so it's nice and close and easy for me to use. As you can imagine, that can be expensive, not just on your credit card, but from a resources perspective. It takes a long time to load up the entire superstore and bring it all to your fridge, right? So there's some things that you've got to think about with this. There are trade-offs. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So just keep that in mind. One particularly problematic area specifically, though, for their, where buffer functions can really help is when somebody's actually written themselves a custom function and they pass a table into it. Tables are brutal for this. And I'm going to show you an example of something that was written inside M is for Data Monkey that will not be inside the new version of the book because we've since discovered that this is actually a really poor form for what we did. So, um, the big caution, as I say, I wanted to, uh, to throw out here, buffering does have overhead. Like I say, it takes a lot of effort to go and grab the whole store and bring it to your fridge, and using it incorrectly can slow down your query load. So you want to make sure you're using it properly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up a, uh, the example file here for buffer function, um, and I'm going to show you uh, just what, the, um, what this actually sort of looks like. So the scenario that we're looking at here is that we have a data table over here and we have a lookup table, okay? So in the original version of MS for Data Monkey, I spent a lot of time writing a function called pqvlookup. And the reason being is because Power Query did not have an equivalent of Excel's vlookup approximate match. Everything was an exact match basis. Now I happen to use a lot of approximate matches in my work. So I need wrote a function for it and that was great except it was really slow. So I want to show you what happens with this. I'm going to actually demonstrate this a little bit here by, uh, by showing you, again, some, uh, some Monkey Tools uh, features here as well. So let me just get rid of the legend on this for a sec. So 
the the original function that we're at, or the original formula that I'm actually looking at here, it gets it gets a little long when it's indented. Not too bad, I guess. But basically, what we're doing is we're looking up the uh, lookup source um, is my lookup table that I'm actually looking for, and the source is data. So this is data. This is the lookup table. And basically, what I'm doing is I'm sorting the rows inside my uh, inside my data table here to get them into uh, into um, into order. And then what I'm doing is I'm invoking this custom function called PQV lookup. Now PQV lookup, this is the function that was written inside MS for Data Monkey. Okay, so it does both an exact match and an approximate match. So that's the the big sort of component around what we're dealing with here. The original version of it, we call the PQV lookup. We're actually calling it three different times in order to get the different lookups from band one, the alternate band, and whatnot. And these guys are going to go and generate this table here for the results. Buffered, this query here called buffered. By the way, I should also show you this. If you click on it, this shows you all the precedents, and you can see the precedents of the queries here as well. So buffered is almost exactly the same as the unbuffered query. The difference is all around what happens right here. If we go and switch to buffered, you'll notice that I just wrapped the lookup table in a command called table.buffer. That is the only difference between these two queries, okay? The only difference at all. This one uses table.buffer to say, go get the store and bring it to me because I want to use it again. Buffered, or the unbuffered one says, just go to the store for every single ingredient on your grocery list. What's the impact of this? Well, the impact I'm going to show you, I'm actually going to go and time this one for you. Um, I'm going to run the buffered and the unbuffered queries here, and I'm going to go and run this over five trials here. I'm not going to bother doubling this to, to do the uh, privacy effect on this or anything like that, um, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go and actually run these. So this is a tool that exists inside my Monkey Tools add-in for Excel that allows you to go and actually time multiple runs of queries to see how long does it actually take in order to do these refreshes. And it's going to keep on feeding back information here, and you're going to get the idea very, very quickly that in this case here, the buffered goes generally much faster than the unbuffered. The other thing that you need to be aware of with Power Query, though, is that you have to run your timing test multiple times. The reason being is because Power Query works on, uh, it runs its entire refresh process um, for a query for end-to-end -end in the chain, uh, it gets run on a single compute thread. And that means that if anything else goes and impacts that compute thread, it can actually drastically impact it. So if you're, say, I don't know, broadcasting live over Teams Live and Teams happens to hit something onto your thread, it's going to impact it. If you happen to farm out another query to another thread, it may be fine until suddenly, I don't know, maybe Spotify goes and, uh, and decides to download or Windows decides to download an update or something like that. It's going to have an impact on, on these different things. So you want to run it multiple times and sort of take the, uh, the averages over these things as to what's going on. Now we're almost done. We've got about uh, 20 seconds left here until this is actually complete. And, uh, and then we're actually going to be able to visualize the results of what's going on inside this um, to see how these actually worked and which one of these is actually faster. The big secret with this one, the PQV lookup function, we actually find a table and we pass it into the PQV lookup function for every single row of the data source table. That means we go back and get the same thing over and over and over again. What I want you to recognize about what's going on here is that this is the buffered query. The average time it took to refresh was 2.6 seconds in this case. And what you see here is that the orange box tells you that um, your 50% of your results, your, your, uh, your lower quartile is the bottom of the yellow box, that the top quartile is here. We have some outliers that you can see here where one result took significantly longer. Uh, your median or mean values, your average is here and your median is, is down the bottom. So there's a lot of stuff that's packed up into this visual. But the big thing I want you to recognize is that the buffered function on average refreshes in about 2.6 seconds. The unbuffered version takes about 15 and a half. So it takes a lot longer to actually do the unbuffered component. Now, the, again, the thing that I want to show you here, if I go and take a look um, specifically at the steps of what's going on here, we'll just let this one refresh for a sec. The lookup source is this. Okay, so this is the table that we're going to be using a little bit later. My actual source data is this guy here. I sort it, and then what I do is I invoke this custom function. When I invoke the custom function, 
We say we want our new column called true. We're going to invoke the custom function here. What's the lookup value? So we're looking up the value from the values column. So for the first line, it's going to be zero. For the second line, it's 14,313. For table array, this is returning an error right now because it doesn't like to return things that are in the same piece. But what we are doing is we're passing in lookup source table, telling it we want column index two and returning the approximate match. The problem is that in the unbuffered query, for every single row, it goes back and it reevaluates this thing here, saying, go get me lookup table. Where did lookup table come from? Oh, lookup table came from the Excel table. So it reloads this data for every single call that it makes, gets a full reload of that data table. The alternate with your buffering is when we do a table.buffer on the lookup table. And all you have to do is just wrap it right here in the formula bar. At this point, it says, go get me this table once. And now, when you invoke the custom function, I want you to use the step that I buffered. So it's already here. Go get it for me nice and quick. You don't need to recalculate it. That's the big difference. And that's why it makes such a huge time or a huge time savings in this case is that you don't have to refresh it on a regular basis. Having said that, I will also throw you a big word of caution here. When I learned about the table.buffer function, the first thing I did is I went into my Power Query and I buffered every single step of my query. And then I watched the load times decrease drastically because every single step was forced to recalculate and be stored in memory along the way. Now, granted, it only had to do it once, but it actually added a huge amount of overhead and slowed things down. So that's not the appropriate way to do things. My advice to you, if you're looking at a scenario where things are running really slowly, is to try buffering a, a you know an individual step usually earlier in the query and then time it and see if it makes a difference if it doesn't get it out because that's not your issue if it does then okay cool then you can keep on working on it to see whether or not you can actually reduce these things but again time it multiple times because the results can vary on these things buffering is really kind of a, a complex topic there's a lot of things that go on and, and uh, it depends on how power query can compile your code sometimes there's a lot of different pieces here uh, the last thing I would do want to show you here um, on this one, there's a couple of components that you can actually see inside uh, this little chart here. Um, and I think uh, the, the big thing I want you to recognize is here's my buffered query. Um, there's two components that are actually happening on this one. And uh, let me just turn on a chart element here. We're going to turn on the legend and we'll put that on the bottom. Uh, I've actually run this with my privacy settings turned off and my privacy settings turned on, which is what your default is. Okay, you will notice that privacy has an impact on how fast your data loads. In all cases, privacy is slower and sometimes significantly slower than when privacy is turned off. You should not turn off privacy unless you know the implications of what that means, that you can leak potentially data out there, which is a problem. But the other thing that I want you to be aware of is, here's my unbuffered query. Okay, so on average here, we're looking at uh, 16.3 seconds. Here's my buffered query where on average, we're looking at about 0.95 seconds in this particular case here. So this one ran very quickly. And down here, I've got my user interface driven method, which is at 0.2. This one happens almost instantly in the five trials that I actually dealt with, unless privacy is turned on, then it's a little bit slower than the buffered version here. What's this all about? This is a pattern that's going to end up in MS for Data Monkey, where you can actually drive your VLOOKUP approximate match entirely through the user interface without having to write any crazy code like what we actually just had. So this is one of the reasons why we actually need to, to update the book and, and whatnot. So if you're interested in that, um, we do have a recipe pattern for this, where uh, basically what it involves is, um, is actually taking your two tables, sorting them and appending them uh, in order to be able to actually work with it in order to get your approximate match rather than doing a, an actual merge, which is what you would kind of expect. So uh, I don't have time to show you that today because um, I'm already a little bit over time on things here, uh, but, um, but it's just something to be aware of. So as I say, when the next version of our book comes out, the new function will be in there, not this, uh, not this thing that I wrote that was actually really, really slow. Um, all right. And on that note, uh, what I'm going to do here is I just want to uh, sort of round out my stuff. Um, the question queue is open, folks, so if you've got questions, please fire them in. Uh, I'll just do my, uh, my quick closing here, and then we can address those. Uh, so um, if, you, uh, if you like the stuff that I do and you want to be in contact with me, I do have a free newsletter at my website. Uh, we give you uh, right away when you sign up, you get my top five Excel tips, top five Power Query tips, my favorites, because, I mean, I've got lots. Uh, my top five Power Pivot and Power BI tips as well. 
Uh, you can sign up for that here at xlguru.ca slash newsletter. Um, we also give you a what's new in, in, in uh, Excel, what's new in Power BI on a monthly basis, as well as tell you about other things that we're working on, where I'm going to be speaking, and all those kind of things as well. So if you're interested in keeping in contact with me, this is one of the best places to do that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Power Query, how to write some of those buffer functions, how to how to actually do a lot of this stuff here or, or get better, learn more about the M code language around it, we do deep dives into that. Um, myself, Miguel Escobar, and Matt Allington uh, run the Power Query Academy at skillwave.training. Uh, this is a huge academy. I think there's uh, the better part of it, if I'm correct, I believe there's over 16 hours of material in here. You get a copy of our book. You get a copy of our recipe cards as well. There's a, a help forum where you can actually get questions or answers for your own stuff that you're working on or even practice on other people's stuff as well. So if you're interested, uh, check that out. Um, we're, uh, we're super proud of the material that goes in there, and we, uh, we work hard on trying to make sure that uh, people are consistently getting value from there and, and updating it and adding new material all the time. Uh, and that is the end of my slideshow for uh, for what we have right now. So I'm just going to kick that off. I'm going to leave some Excel up on the screen. And um, at this point, I am open for questions. How little do we have anything in the queue at all that people want to know? Uh, there, there, there is one question. It's beyond my expertise, so I will read it as it is. Can we train a machine lear learning learning model via Power BI tools? I ask it because of the buffer's ability to iterate. I have no idea. I'm not a machine <laughs> learning guy. That's uh, that's not Me my too. forte. I'm more of a self-service BI guy. So when it comes to machine learning, I uh, I would tend to uh, to go and find someone who's an expert in that area and ask them. I apologize. I that's uh, I don't want to. I don't want. You don't even want to guess because I I would not have a good answer there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a great question though. <laughs> uh... Yes, uh, actually there isn't any question, but I have a question for you uh, sure. about adding that surrogate, surrogate key to the table. How yeah. performant is it? Yeah. How oh, oh, sorry. How, how performant is it? Yes. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so here's the challenge. Uh, challenge with these things, right? Um, how performant is it? Is I can say that when I've had to do this for my models, that the performance on it has not been what I would consider horrendous. But this is obviously very subject to interpretation uh, along the way. I am very much a believer when uh, when I do my models that uh, not all time is created equal. So I am, in, on many cases, willing to sacrifice a five-minute reload for my data, even an Excel worksheet for my data model, if that's what it takes to get the data in there providing that I will never suffer more than a five second refresh on a slicer when somebody clicks a slicer to go and slice something. Um, and this is one of the big, big things that I kind of look at because I can tell my client, look, when you need to do a refresh, hit, hit refresh, go get a coffee or whatever else, come back, everything's going to be inside there. Now, I'm not going to say that it's going to create that because I've got other models um, that I've built uh, where, you know, when I'm sort of running tests on these things, the model will refresh in you know, anywhere between 30 seconds and four minutes, depending on what it actually is. So is there a performance hit by building a circuit key? Yes. Is it necessary in order to be able to get the job done from a self-service BI perspective? Yes, sometimes it is. And if it's the only thing that, or if it, if it is the thing that you need to do in order to make your model refresh, then there's nothing else that's gonna help you. So you're kind of stuck. Is it a better idea to go back to your IT department and say, hey, listen, IT, I really need a surrogate key on this to give me a proper instance for this thing. Can you build one of those things for me? Absolutely. But let's face it, most of the time when a self-service BI user goes back to the IT department and says, hey, IT, can you help me with this? They say no. And you say, but I haven't even asked you what I need. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We don't want to talk to you, right? So so th this is the kind of thing that, that I think that we need to sort of throw out there with these things is it really depends on, you know, is it what you really want to do at the end of the day? The whole point behind what we do with a lot of things inside Excel and Power BI is we're trying to do our self-service BI modeling to find out what reports actually have value that IT has not had the time or doesn't want to create for us so that we can go back to them to say, I've built this business case for you and now their performance is really hurting me, but we need this on a regular basis. Can you now help me make this more efficient? It's about prototyping rapidly without wasting IT's time and resources. Now, I know in the Power BI side, there's a lot of people that are looking at it going, hey, this is the this is this going to change everything. We're going to do every report and this kind of stuff. But, you know, those 
companies generally, when they're in that area, they have a very strong tie into IT, and IT is going to help them model that data in the right way so that it actually helps us happen, right? You know, does that make sense? Like, there's there's a balance that we're playing in this case. Exactly. So that's a long way of avoiding your question, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yes, there's a performance impact, but sometimes it's necessary. So how bad is it? You have to test it and see with your data. I agree so, with you. I, I, would, uh, I would definitely say that personally, um, for, for my side, uh, if I'm concerned about performance, I'm going to create a surrogate key that does not have meaning because that's just done by adding an index column and it's super, super easy. Um, but that's actually, you know, so so that's going to be a little bit faster than creating a, a surrogate key with meaning. Um, but, you know, there's still more that needs to be done with merging it back to the fact table that's going to have some overhead as well. So, so there you go. Okay, any questions? Um, I think I might yeah, see maybe. maybe one more in there. Oh, okay, so never never mind. That was the uh, that was the question on the uh, mm -hmm. on the learning model. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't see anything else that's come into the queue either at this point in time. So, um, at this point, I guess I say thanks for having me. Uh, hello, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity with us. I hope uh, I hope folks have learned something interesting here or, or been inspired yeah, by. Yeah, the, 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 these were marvelous tricks, uh, tips. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Can I uh, can I also just throw a, a shout out for um, in about uh, about oh man uh, twelve hours from now uh, we're actually going to be kicking off the uh, Vancouver Power BI user group for uh, for my um, I've got uh, Gosh Kamenchuk is going to be coming to uh, to do a, a, a chat on uh, Power Query as well so if people are interested in that uh, that is going to be happening like I say in about twelve hours from now. Uh, if you look up uh, Vancouver Power BI user group on uh, on Meetup, I'll, I'll just throw that up on screen here. Um, people can uh, can come to that one as well, because um, you know, hey, let's face it, free training is always uh, is always fun, right? So, um, right there on, at uh, Meetup.com, Vancouver Power BI user group. If you uh, if you're interested, so I'm already a member of it. Fantastic. We'll see you there. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we don't have. Further questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Ken. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate your help, your time, your tricks, your uh, informations regarding Power Query. Thanks for the book. Thanks absolutely. for everything. <laughs> absolutely happy to. This is uh, this is what we do. We love it. So awesome. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Thanks a lot. See everyone. Bye bye. Bye.